Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grace Church. We are so excited that you are here with us this morning to lift our voices and our praise before the Lord. Uh, I'd like to open us up uh, with our call to worship this morning out of Psalm 107. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story, those He redeemed from the hand of the foe. Let them give thanks to the Lord for His unfailing love and His wonderful deeds for mankind. Let them sacrifice thank offerings and tell of His works with songs of joy. Let them exalt Him in the assembly of the people and praise Him in the council of the elders. Would you stand with us as we begin our time of worship together, singing. Great is your faithfulness, O God. You wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us Your grace is enough 
shall bring and joy to the nations when Jesus is King. If you'd like to follow along in the hymnal on this next song, it's page 105. And all of God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Good morning once again. And again, we are just so glad that you are here with us this morning. Just a few uh, announcements to keep before you. Uh, we still are taking orders for poinsettias. If you'd be interested in purchasing one to help decorate the church through Advent and Christmas, and then after our Christmas Eve service, then to take it home and decorate your home house, your own house with. Uh, that is still available. They are twelve dollars a piece. You can just drop a check off in the um, in the uh, box out in the foyer, and then we will purchase them. And then go ahead and do their decorating, and then you pick it up after Christmas Eve. This coming Saturday, the twenty fourth, from three to four uh, in the afternoon, is our harvest party, which we're car car calling a harvest parky because we just can't gather in the same numbers as we typically do. So from three to four out in the parking lot here at the church, a number of people are going to have their trunks open with some games and candy for the little ones. So we invite you to come back out for that if you'd like to be a part of it. Uh, there still is opportunities for that. I encourage you to see Jen Leibarger or contact her or our children's ministry director 
and she can help you um, iron all that out. Our, our women's retreat is coming up very soon, the first weekend in November. So ladies, if you are interested in that, you can see Nicole Shriver or you can see Liz Nelson. They can give you more information. It's just a day-long retreat. And then lastly, um, I just want to remind you that we have a podcast here at the church. Uh, and I encourage you to take advantage of that. You can get it wherever you get your own podcasts on any of those formats. Um, just this past week, we did a roundtable with all the pastors in the church and had a great conversation about pastoral ministry, about how it's changed over the last few years and where we see it heading in the next few years. And I actually put all of them on the spot and asked them if they prefer to do weddings or funerals. So if you would like to answer to that question, you're going to have to download the podcast and listen to that. It's called Grounding Our Faith, and you can get that, again, anywhere where you get your regular podcasts, but I certainly encourage you uh, to do that. It's a great teaching tool and uh, a great uh, opportunity for you to hear from a lot of the staff here at the church in a non-formal setting, opportunities to ask them questions you probably wouldn't on a Sunday morning, uh, but I do encourage you to do that. Our scripture reading this morning is out of the book of Hebrews. Uh, if you have a Bible with you, we'd love for you to uh, follow along. If you don't, there's probably one located under the seat in front of you. Uh, Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. This will be the passage that Pastor Lou will be working through uh, in a few moments. Hebrews 3. Therefore, holy brothers, you who, who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy for, for more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house. Indeed, we hold fast to our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Every once in a while, we as a church have an opportunity to hear from one of our missionaries, or in this case, uh, somebody preparing to go to the mission field. So I want to invite Jeremy Windler to come on up and share about uh, where his family is at and uh, where they're going in terms of Paraguay. Well, good morning, everyone. So, like Paul said, my name's Jeremy Windler. About two years ago, I had the privilege of standing up here to share me and my wife, Kayla's, vision to be a part of taking the gospel to the least reached people groups of the world. With the church's blessing, we packed up and left New Hampshire with our new five-week-old son and attended a missions training institute focused on equipping missionaries to do church planting amongst least reached people groups. Well, by God's grace, we completed that training this spring and joined an organization called Partners for Paraguay. So right now, we're in the process of raising support with plans to head to Paraguay, South America as missionaries. So why Paraguay? Well, some of you may remember me sharing in the past that I was born and grew up in Paraguay. And because of this, I've had first-hand experience in seeing the many needs that exist, especially amongst the indigenous people groups, and particularly the lack of access they have to the gospel message. I remember a time when an indigenous man hiked from several villages away to come see us. He came particularly to see my dad and ask him whether he would come and teach his family about God. And I remember the heaviness in my dad's heart that day. He had to turn him away basically say he couldn't teach him at that time. You might be asking, why would my dad say no? Wasn't that what we were there for? Simply put, my dad didn't have any more time or energy to give. He was already putting in over 70 hours a week in ministry, on top of being a good father to the family. I remember my dad often quoting Matthew 9:37 to me. In this verse, Jesus says to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful. But the labors are few. For many indigenous people groups in Paraguay, this is still the case. I'd like to give a few statistics that paint the picture of the needs that are there in Paraguay. There are around 19 to 20 different tribal groups, each made up of a varying number of villages or colonies. I don't have time to give numbers on all of them, but at least give a few percentages and statistics on a couple groups. 
One, the Pai Tabutena. They have 74 communities in Paraguay. And they're around 80 to 85 percent unreached, meaning they have little to no viable access to the gospel message. The Ava Guarani, it's another group, has around 156 communities, roughly 70 percent of which are unreached and isolated from any gospel witness. The Mbua have 150 to 200 communities in Paraguay and are between 90 to 95 percent unreached. These communities are very isolated and resistant to the gospel, but God is working and doors are opening to ministry there. And the Bua are probably one of the least reached people groups in all of Paraguay. Aside from the obvious lack of the gospel message, these communities are also plagued by major issues like the lack of sustainable economics, lack of education, adolescent and teen suicide, drug and alcohol addiction, prostitution, and drug and human trafficking. Now inevitably, when I mention these kinds of issues, people start asking, is it safe in Paraguay? In answer, I must say, in many areas, probably not. Last year, while we were going through training, me and my wife received the sad news that one of my relatives, serving in Paraguay as a missionary, was shot and killed. This did cause me to question our plans. Did I really want to give up the comfort and safety of the U.S. and take my family overseas? In answer, here's the conclusion I feel God led us to. Our fear does not change that God is sovereign. Our fear does not change God's love for the lost. And our fear does not change the command that God gave in Matthew 28, 19 to go and make disciples of all nations. And if my family were in the same shoes as the unreached of this world, I hope someone would be willing to take the risk to tell me about Jesus. And wouldn't you? In Romans 1, 14 through 16, Paul states this, I'm under obligation both to the Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish, so I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. In the first part of that statement, Paul exemplifies the attitude that the Christian should have about the gospel message. You see, Paul understands the gospel is the cure to the most destructive cancer and disease the world has ever known. In it is the message of how our broken relationship with God can be restored. In knowing this, Paul recognizes we Christians don't just have a task, but an obligation to spread the gospel message to the world. A friend of mine who passed away of cancer recently made this statement. The only thing you can take to heaven is other people. Invest in them. Everything else is irrelevant. It's with these kinds of truths in our mind that Kayla and I are raising support to go to Paraguay as missionaries, and our plan, God willing, is to be there by 2022 or sooner, if God provides. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Father, thank you so much for Jeremy and Kayla, for them responding to the call and the burden that you have placed on them. I pray that they would be surrounded by generous individuals, those being willing to pray, those being willing to give of their resources so that Jeremy and Kayla would feel free to go to those who have yet to hear the good news of the gospel. Father, I pray that you'd be instilling within all of us that desire because the reality is over two billion people in this world live in places where they have yet to hear of the good news of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that that would weigh heavy on our hearts, that we would look to be ambassadors in whatever spheres you would put us to properly represent you in this world that is becoming more and more hostile. And as we do look at this world, Father, we, we look at it in sadness. And, and I wonder, Father, how can anyone look at this world without hope? But I thank you that the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And I pray, Father, that that would be the message that we would take to them. That they can find peace and they can find hope. Not in the things that the world is offering, but in you and in you alone. Father, I pray that you would burden us in such a way that we would be compelled to take this message to all that would hear. And we do pray this in your name. Amen invite you to stand with us as we continue in our time of singing. There 
is the truth older than the ages there is a promise of things yet to come there is one born for our salvation Jesus there is a light that overwhelms the darkness there is the kingdom that forever reigns. There is freedom from the chains that bind us. Jesus, Jesus, who walks on the water, who speaks to the sea, who stands in the fire beside.
Our Lord, it is that great name of Jesus that we have come together now to center our thoughts and be prepared for another week of walking in the wilderness of this world. And we do recognize that Jesus is superior to everything this world has to offer. May you drill that into us and give us more confidence and more hope today as we encourage one another in Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Hebrews 3 is our text for today, Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. If you don't have a Bible, there's some under the seats in front of you, and, and uh, take some time to find that. Everyone needs a hero to emulate and motivate them in this life. Most of us have someone that we consider a hero. We can picture someone in our minds that uh, we wish we were like. Maybe it's a sports hero or a national hero or even a Christian leader. They are important because they serve as moral examples for us to imitate. The nation of Israel had many heroes as well, but unquestionably the most prominent one of all, the most revered, was Moses. The Jews respected the angels we've seen, but when they turned to the earth, Moses was on the top of the list. It's not bad to have heroes, but it is a sin to partake in hero worship. And many in the Jewish community at this time of this writing were on the verge of revering Moses a little too much. We have seen that the entire book of Hebrews is about the superiority of Christ over everything in the world. And it stands to reason that Moses is brought to the dock as a witness now. So in the first six verses of chapter 3, Moses and Jesus are compared side by side. And clearly Jesus is superior to even the great Moses in at least three ways in our text. Moses led a physical delivery, but Jesus leads a spiritual one. Moses was part of God's salvation, but Jesus is the heart of salvation. Moses was a servant, but Jesus is the son. So let's look at that first comparison in verse 1. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus. The word therefore is a conjunction, and it connects the chap- chapter 2 before it with chapter 3. And if you were here last week or over the past few weeks, we learned that in that chapter, Jesus is superior to angels. That was the first comparison. They were powerful and very important in God's program, but they could not do what Jesus did to save humanity. Based on this previous argument, the author now asks for his readers to keep looking and look at Jesus. And he calls the readers holy brothers because of the work of the high priest Jesus. The word brothers is a very familiar word in Greek. It's adelphos, and it means from the same womb. And here it's used in a general way to speak of mankind in general and and refers to brothers and sisters or siblings. We were all born into the family of God through the Holy Spirit, and when we were, God declared us as holy because of what Christ did for us, his righteousness overflows us, and we are viewed as holy in God's eyes. But then we learn that we become progressively more weaned from the sin of this world day by day as we grow in Christ. But as siblings, we share in a heavenly calling. We are partners, that's what sharing means. When Christ died and rose from the dead and then ascended into heaven, he took us with us in spirit, and in the future we will be partakers of heaven. We have received a heavenly call. Now, because of what he did through his life and death, we need to consider him. The word consider is from, uh, originally, the English word is from Latin con, which means examine, and sider, which means the stars. And originally, that word meant to consider the stars, look look and and study them, chart them out. It's a very intensive word. But The word behind our text is a Greek word, and uh, it is kata noeo, and kata means to look down 
at something, and naeo is to think. And so it means to think upon something very closely. That's what consider means. And what should we consider? Well, the object is Jesus. If you've ever tried to master a subject, you realize that you don't just study the subject, you study the opposite of it to, as a contrast. And so before we can really understand Jesus, we need to consider the contrast here, which is Moses. Unfortunately, many of us don't know a whole lot about Moses. We've known the name, but we, we don't know as much as we might think. And so let me take a few moments, in case there are people here, that, that don't know the history of Moses. It's a good review for us who do know him, because uh, that's the audience who's reading this are Jewish people, and they know Moses very well. And so the author didn't have to go into that. But number one, Moses was divinely delivered in his childhood, Exodus chapter 2. He was born during a time when all of Israel was in captivity under Egypt, and uh, the Pharaoh was getting increasingly harsh in his commands for the Israeli people. And they were growing so much that they were outgrowing in population the Egyptians. And so the Pharaoh made an edict that all male Jewish boys would be drowned in the Nile River the minute they were born. This was a way of controlling their population infanticide, something our nation is getting to. In dependence on God, Moses' mother put him in a little basket made of bulrushes and floated him in the reeds of the Nile River. Our children know this story. Soon the Pharaoh's daughter came along to take a bath and she found the baby floating in the water and she took pity on it and realized it was one of the Jewish babies and she couldn't understand why her father was killing them. And we know the story that Miriam, Moses' sister, was sitting in the bushes and when she saw the Pharaoh's daughter was favorable, she got up and said, you want I should find a nurse for it? And of course she got her own mother, Moses' mother, to raise the child, but he was raised in the house of the Pharaoh. Consider Jesus. Let's contrast his history to Moses. Our Lord came into existence through a miracle, not just superintending of God, but through a miracle of a virgin birth. Moses had a great beginning, but Christ's was miraculous. He was born in obscurity, and according to Revelation chapter 12, which some of us have been studying in the past weeks, the devil was waiting to consume him the minute he was born. Not just the Pharaoh, but the devil himself. Moses was great. Jesus is greater. While well, time went on, Moses grew up and he had many adventures, and we have to skip some of them. But unfortunately, he found himself on the lamb running in the wilderness because he had killed an Egyptian uh, who struck one of his brethren. And so he's hiding for years and years and we pan forward to a time when God called him out of a burning bush in Exodus 3. In a miraculous display, God appeared in, in, in a burning bush that wasn't being consumed, and that would get your attention. And so Moses went over and said, what is this? And out of the bush, God calls Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. And it was there that God told him of the affliction of his people and how he wanted him to be the deliverer. You know the story, Moses resisted at first. I can't speak none too good. And he didn't want to do it. He doubted his abilities, and so God impressed upon him. You don't have to worry about credentials. You tell your people the great I am, who I am, is commanding you to go. And so he was sent. Consider Jesus. Likewise, he was called. In fact, our text tells us he was called the apostle, an apostle means a sent one. He's the ultimate sent one. And he was appointed to deliver all those who would believe in him. Moses was out in the wilderness protecting himself when he got his call. He had to be convinced. He wasn't all that crazy about it. But Jesus came to the earth and he went into the wilderness for temptation just to prove that he was who he said he was. He wanted to come in the first place. It was a willing choice. This call led to Moses becoming the divine deliverer. Chapters 7 through 12 of Exodus, Pharaoh increased his pressure upon the nation. He made them make bricks out of things that, out of inferior materials. 
And if anyone disobeyed, they were treated harshly. And so God had had enough with the slavery. And he sent Moses to preach to Pharaoh. And so you have this mere Hebrew uh, confronting the most powerful man on the earth, Pharaoh. He went boldly in before him and said, let my people go. By the way, he's a, he's a perfect mediator because he's both raised in the Pharaoh's house, but he's a Jew, and so he represents them. But Pharaoh wouldn't let the people go, and so God used Moses to release a, a series of plagues, one at a time upon the Egyptians, aimed at their false gods to knock the foundations out from underneath them. The first plague was blood in the Nile River. And if you know anything about Egypt, the Nile is Egypt. There's so little water in that region, nobody lived in the hinterlands. You lived within a mile of the river or you couldn't live because you needed water. And when it was turned to blood, it certainly messed up their lives. The second plague consisted of frogs. Everywhere they looked, there were frogs. They were in their tub, they were in their beds, they were in their tofu soup. And the Egyptian goddess was named Heket, which means frog head. The third plague was gnats, need I say any more. The fourth were flies. The fifth was disease among the livestock. The sixth consisted of boils on man and beast. The seventh was hail that killed many animals and people. The eighth was locusts, which ate all the crops. And then the ninth was a plague of darkness. Egypt believed in many gods, and so the true God was showing them that their sub-gods were inferior. God was superior. But Pharaoh still wouldn't let Israel go. And so God had to step up the intensity. And the tenth plague found in Exodus 11.4 is the promise that he, an angel was going to kill the firstborn of every family and every animal if they did not repent. But this time, it covered the Jews as well as a test of their own faith. And so they were under that sentence. But an avenue of salvation was given by Moses. He told the people that if each family who believed in Yahweh, who believed in God, would choose a lamb without spot and blemish and then sacrifice that lamb and draw the blood out and then paint it on the post and lintels of their house, that when the death angel flew by, they would pass over their house and not strike it. And thus, Moses gave the greatest celebration of the Jewish faith, the Passover. Consider Jesus. Jesus is the Passover lamb who died for the sins of the world. He is greater than the one who promised the lamb. He is the lamb. Well, Moses then continued to lead the people. He led them away from Pharaoh. He chased them into the Red Sea. God dried up the Red Sea, swallowed Pharaoh's army. Great miracles surrounded this man, Moses. And while he was in the wilderness, Moses became the agent of giving the law and the covenant the Ten Commandments are the heart of the law, and they're the most famous standard for human behavior that has ever been found its place on earth. And you remember the Ten Commandments, right? If you don't, we should constantly review them. One God, no idols, respect God's name, remember the Sabbath day, honor your father and mother, don't murder don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, and don't covet. We should constantly remember those laws. But consider this, consider Jesus. Christ fulfilled the law. He kept it in every part which no other person has ever done. Moses gave the law, Jesus kept it to the nth degree. Therefore, he is greater. Not only did Moses give Israel the law, he organized the Levitical system. That's what the book of Leviticus is all about. And in it, he instructed them how to build the tabernacle. And then that became the temple, the greatest symbol of God's presence on the face of the earth. Furthermore, he gave what we know as the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And on top of this, God had him say this about himself in Numbers 12.3, that he was the meekest man on earth. 
even if he did say so himself. But you see, he had learned from 40 years of desert life to lose his pride, and God said, that's all right, say this about yourself. I'm telling you what to say. Not only was God with Moses at the beginning of his life in the basket, but he's the one who personally buried him out of respect for him, but also because he was such a well-loved man, God knew that people would worship his gravesite, like Elvis. He was a great man, so great that there's even a dog named after him. Uh, that, that's, that's my dog, Moses. But I would never name my dog Jesus. Is it any wonder why Moses was a hero to the Israelites? We cannot consider Jesus without considering Moses. Jesus is superior in every way. So what should they see when they focus upon him? They see that he's the apostle, he's the sent one, and he's the apostle of our confession, as our verse reads. And the word confession means... uh, to speak the same thing, to be the source of what we all agree about as a, as, as a church. And what is that? We believe in Christ and the gospel. The gospel is that we, are, we have been redeemed from sin in this world, and we are pilgrims now, and Christ is our leader in the wilderness of this world. Moses led a limited number of Israelites to a physical destiny, but Jesus leads all those who believe in his saving work to the ultimate promised land of heaven. And so the one thing that we must all agree upon if we are to live above the fray in this world is the definition of the gospel. It is that, and this is what saves you if you don't know what that means, listen, The gospel is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to earth and took on human flesh. He lived a completely holy, spotless life so that he could become the perfect sacrifice to take, to die in our stead and in our place. He was then buried to prove that he had died and he rose again to prove that he was God. We must never forget considering Jesus. This means that we should verbally declare that message wherever we go and we should back it with our lives and be willing to even die for that message have you received the gospel have you trusted that christ saved you have you called out to him lord lord i know i am a sinner and i know i could not pay for my own sins and 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 see you again and so i accept that jesus died for me and rose again There are other ways that we depreciate the gospel. For many, Jesus is just one more priority among many. Our life can be uh, likened to a wagon wheel, if you can imagine it, with wooden spokes, you know. And, And to some people, Jesus is just one spoke out of eight. The truth is we need to view him as the hub. He's the one who gives energy to all the spokes and everything needs to go through the hub. And so when we focus on Jesus and we consider him, that means his teaching and his thoughts should be what govern all the other spokes, whether it's your family or your schooling, your job or whatever. Jesus needs to come first. He does not just come to be added to our lives. He comes to transform our lives. We need to concentrate on his word. And we all know people who are good at concentrating. Geniuses are that way. A brilliant mathematician, Norbert Weiner, was walking across the campus of MIT, and he was so absorbed in thought that a student greeted him, and he didn't pay any attention. And then he took a few steps, and he stopped, and he turned around, and he asked the student, can you tell me where I just came from? And the student said, yes, that way. And the professor said, oh, good, now I know I ate lunch. (laughs) Are you that preoccupied with Christ? Moses was faithful in the household of God. Jesus was far more so. The next comparison of the superiority of Christ is that Moses was simply a part of the house. Christ built the house, verse 3. But for Jesus... 
has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of the house has more honor than the house itself. And then, as a parenthetical thought to show that Jesus is God, it says, for every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. The word house is used six times in these verses. Moses was the builder of what we call the old covenant having to do with Israel. Jesus is the builder of both, but culminates with the New Testament. He's the builder. He's the creator. And so he's worthy of more honor than someone who's just living in the house. Lastly, Jesus is superior to Moses because like the angels, Moses was just a servant. Jesus is the son Verse 5, now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant. And what did he do? To testify to the things that were to be spoken of later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. So Moses is faithful, but he's a servant. In God's grace, God calls him a servant with a a better name than the typical word for servant. The typical word for servant is slave, somebody who has no choice. But the word here is theropon, which means that he actually voluntarily became a servant. And what did he do? He testified to things to come. He spoke of Jesus. And Jesus is saying that he is the one who he pointed to. I mean, remember uh, when Christ was walking on the road to Emmaus with the two disciples? It says he opened the scriptures and he showed them from Moses through the prophets everything that spoke about him. In fact, many authors believe that the book of Hebrews consists of what Jesus shared with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Think about that. That's that's what we're walking through now. We didn't have to be there with Jesus. we're, We're getting the message right now. All the things that Moses accomplished were just a fraction compared to what Jesus accomplished. Moses was a servant. Jesus is the son. The son built the house. The son runs the house. The son pays attention to those who are in the house. And who is the house? Verse 6. Verse 6. And we are his house. His house is the body of believers. In the Old Testament, the body was Israel. In the New Testament, it is the church. The church is God's house, not a building. And we all know that in our heads, that the church the church is not the building, it's the people. We, we say that all the time, but I, I wonder if we uh, really comprehend that. We don't act like it sometimes. And you hear about it every once in a while. Oh, This is God's house. We can't drink coffee in the sanctuary. We can't eat in God's house, even though we're called to eat a meal every month around communion. We think, oh, I can't pray to God unless I'm in the sanctuary with quiet music and dark lights. Can't pray unless you're in the sanctuary. We know that's not true. The church is you. You are the house. And there are many ways that this family gets together other than on Sunday morning. Right now, our men are away at a men's retreat, or some of them anyway. I I guess not all of them, but uh, it so happens, though, that we value getting together all at once from time to time. And, and, And it seems to be the habit of the church since the beginning that they like to get together just like you like to get together at least for Thanksgiving with all of your extended family. There's something about it that energizes you, and that's why we desire to be together. We don't need a building, but around here, we need a building. You're either freezing or hot or... It's raining, and we could survive if we didn't get together like this, but we believe it's a good practice that that has history behind it because that's how we encourage one another. When we ignore the gathering of ourselves, we ignore the value of God's spiritual house, and it cuts our boldness in half when we are not together. And what do we do when we come together? Consider Jesus. I mean, do you, do you think about the songs that we sang? 
That's what we sing about every week. Jesus' name is what makes the difference. You name his name and it changes someone's life. That's what we consider. We sing about his glory and then we take time to look at a particular thing about him as we exposit a particular passage. And then in our other times out throughout the week, you get together and you zero in on a particular teaching because we all need to do that. So you're a wonderful house. It's really fantastic. And Christ has done all of these things for us, and he asks us to hold fast our confidence. We need to focus on him. Moses did great things, but Christ did greater things. And so he tells us to hold fast our confidence. What's that mean? How is your perseverance? How are you holding up in these days? Are the waves of life washing you away from your anchor? Is Jesus still the love of your life? Are you running to him or are you hiding from him? Are you confident in the message of the gospel or are you ashamed of the gospel of Christ? Since Christ is superior, we're called to start living like he is superior. We are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence in our boasting. Confidence is the freedom of speech and openness. It's the call for us to speak truth regardless of what the culture thinks. And you know, we're going up against a culture which which hates the way that we believe. Does it melt your resolve? The if clause here in verse 6 is not saying that we can lose our salvation. That would contradict the overall theme of the book. The theme of the book is that Jesus is the author. What's that? The beginner. And the finisher of our faith. It doesn't say in between that you get to cut the cord. He's the author and the finisher. Holding fast is what we do to demonstrate that we are on board and that we have confidence. Now, there will be those who profess to be a part of the house who really are not. And like the parable of the seeds, when adversity hits, they disappear. They disappear. But the believer, the true believer, perseveres and trouble just intensifies their hope. Chuck Swindoll warns those who are truly in the household of faith live under the father's roof and the son's watchful eye. However, they are not immune to stumbling or tripping or even falling flat on their faces sometimes. And so when I refer to stumbling, I'm talking about occasional one-time fallings, not the character of our whole Christian life. We all stumble, don't we? We all sin every week in ways that we don't want to admit. I mean, Moses himself got angry and struck a rock, right? And what happened? He couldn't go into the promised land, but he still made it to heaven. See, that's the sub-theme of the book of Hebrews. Your, Your faith in Christ's work is what gets you to heaven. Your enjoyment of earth is dependent on your obedience. The warning here is to the Jewish body that's reading this book, and the author is saying some of you aren't really on board. And I'm telling you, don't abandon your faith in Christ for Judaism. Don't go back. To do that demonstrates that you never fully understood who Christ was. So examine your roots, and we need to do the same thing. Are you really trusting in the finished work of Christ for your salvation and how you live, or is it just an added spoke to your life? True, regenerated believers will persevere to the end We will keep our focus on Christ. We will look ahead to the hope of his return to relieve us of this place. A lack of confidence is given to us as an example in the nation of Israel when they approached the promised land. Remember, they'd been wandering for a little while. They approached the promised land and they sent in spies, right? And when the spies came back, the people said, we're not going in there. And when you ask them, they say, I know that, that God parted the sea and saved us from Egypt. I know that I've been wearing the same moccasins for years and they don't wear out. I know that food fell from the sky and, like bread and, and, and quail. And I know that water gushed forth from a rock every time we were thirsty. 
but God's not going to be able to overcome the enemies in the promised land. They had all the evidence of God working in their lives, but they wanted to go back. But confidence could be seen in Joshua and and Caleb. When they went in, they came out and said, this is nothing. (laughs) Look what God's been doing for us. Yeah, there's giants in the land, but God will mow them over. See, we have to be careful lest we lose out on the blessings of a life of confidence in the faith. Can you see the similarity between us and Israel sometimes? I know God has worked in my life, but he could never help me in the present block that I'm going through right now. I know he has delivered me many times in the past, but I don't believe he can take this addiction away from me. I don't believe that he can restore this broken relationship of my life. God is God, but he's not that powerful. You see, the sin of Israel and the sin of the church is a short memory. God loves to do the impossible. And if the impossible has been slowing down in your life, it might be a sign that you are no longer trusting in him, but you're handling it on your own because you really don't believe that he can deliver you. What is the role of a son? They take care of everything. They possess everything, and they do what they like with the ones in the house. The house, you and I, were made for him. Ephesians 3, 7 says that Christ may make his home in your hearts by faith. Christ's come into you. You need to let him live through you. So Christ is superior to Moses because he brings us to eternal life that affects our physical life. He's the builder of the house. He's the son of the house who runs it and has our best in mind. All we have to do is trust him. Now, I can't help but make uh, some reflections on the history of this church here itself. He's back on June 1st, 1986. I preached this passage to a very small group who was getting ready to build the first time. And we were afraid of building. We didn't want to buy land. We had outgrown the Grange Hall that we were meeting in a half a mile across the road here. We needed to do something, but we just didn't think that We had it in us to be able to afford to build. And I remember encouraging people to look at God's work in their lives and in in the founding of our church, and I encouraged them to remember their individual salvations, which were only a couple years old at that particular time. And I reminded them about the early days when three or four individuals felt a burden for a church in this town And they dreamed and they prayed that maybe someday we would be able to reach maybe 50 people, maybe 100. I remember when there were only 15 people in this church counting everything that breathed, including the mouse underneath the kitchen stove. I remember having a budget of $3,000 a year, including our missionaries. I remember when Gail Woodward, bless her soul, came to my house during the fall of 1981 and, and asked me to join a potluck supper that was happening that night with a group of people that were looking to start a church. And I've had the privilege of watching some of you grow ever since. And it's tremendous. God has truly done miracles among us. Nevertheless, you know, there is a danger of losing faith and thinking that there's nothing left to do. And so we face a similar obstacle right now as we did in the early days of this church. We have a new building project in front of us in the middle of a pandemic. What kind of idiots would build during a time (laughs) when we're told we're never gonna get together again? And we ask ourselves, how can we do this? And the answer is we cannot unless we consider Jesus, and he can do anything. We need constant encouragement, and that is what the house of God is all about. It's not just the teaching. It is the way that we encourage one another to keep walking in endurance. And enthusiasm keeps our confession strong. On March 10th, 1904, the great escape artist Houdini 
was challenged to a contest in London to have his hands handcuffed with six different locks, and on each lock there were nine tumblers that he would have to figure out how to get unlocked. And so he agreed to the challenge at the Hippodrome in London. And he had a big box in which he went into, and he disappeared into the box, and 20 minutes later, he rose up, and the audience clapped, and he said, I just need a little more light down there, and he went down for another 20 minutes, and there was silence. And then 20 minutes later, he got up, and he was still bound, but he pulled a knife out of his front pocket, and he ripped his, his heavy clothes off so that he could move more, and then he disappeared again for another 15 minutes, and then he got up for a brief time, because his knees hurt, and then he went down again for 15 minutes. And each time, the audience clapped. And then finally, the last time, he was freed. Now, a reporter investigated and asked him, why did he keep coming up when he really wasn't loose? And he said, honestly, I needed to hear the encouragement of my people. You see, don't underestimate the encouragement that goes on when we gather together in this house of believers. It's what keeps us going in the faith. I am encouraged when I see and hear how God is working in your life. I'm discouraged when I see that he's not. But God still has much for us to do here. There may be one more young person that needs to be raised up and trained so that they can go and join Jeremy Windler and others to bring the gospel to places where they do not consider Jesus. Are you weary because of the cultural attacks upon our faith in this day? Consider Jesus. Is he at the center of your life or is he merely an add-on? Is he a spoke or the hub? What needs to happen in your life to make sure he becomes the hub? You must pay attention to the, God's word if we are God's house and members of one another. Are you ready to keep enduring until the day that Jesus returns? That's what he asks of us. And your steadfastness through thick and thin right now communicates to him that you know he is worthy. Let's pray. Our Father, we are so thankful for the encouragement of your word, for the encouragement of your body. Lord, we just lift up this project before us that it would be finished in due time, that you would bring us back to a point of being able to, uh, with great boldness and confidence, sing at the top of our lungs without worrying. Lord, spare us and heal our land. And may you raise up one or two more young people before we're done who will go forth and change the world for you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us as we close together? Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? Do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that we could see it all made new? We do. Is all creation groaning? Is a new creation coming? It is. And is the glory of the Lord to be a light within our midst? It is. Is it good that we remind ourselves of this?
found to be worthy, slain from the foundations of the world. Be all glory, majesty, power, both for now and evermore. Amen. You're dismissed.